Christians, I have to say. Um, so I, I, can see, I can see all the names, yeah. Yeah, you can see the names of the guys are here. Um, I am delighted to have you with us, not just because of how you can speak to this week's topic, which is, uh, you know, field reporting, match reporting, and the intricacies of deadline reporting, but I do think that kind of, uh, without blowing too much smoke up your arse, pound for pound, in terms Thank of... You. Um, Irish sports journalism over the last kind of couple of decades, I do think that your career is kind of one of the more inspiring and impressive for the rest of the guys who are here, um, kind of thinking back to when you were in their shoes. And I think, you know, our paths have crossed kind of from time to time, uh, usually at World Cups. But yeah. <laughs> it impressed me before our paths crossed and since is your drive. Um, and I, you know, I think foremost in my mind is your output when you were a freelancer. Jesus Christ, you put the rest of us to shame. But, you know, even since then as a staffer, your drive to cover football and to inform and to analyze, I think is just something that the guys, I hope, are kind of acutely aware of. And your drive to kind of get yourself where you deserve to be, which is where you are now, um, arguing with 140,000 people on Twitter. <laughs> I, 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 put that, I, I put that on the back burner now. <laughs> it's good, it's good. It's too much, too much. Um, I started off the chat with Ken a few weeks ago and I got scolded for using a wanky phrase like uh, your journalism journey. Uh, so I won't use that. Um, yeah, you can imagine how much he hated that. Um, I've, been too, I've been in North America too long. But nonetheless, given today's forum, I think it is important to at least kind of reference or speak a little bit about kind of your own university days and the timeline from there to here. Yeah. I, I, it's maybe I've seen maybe we've been chatting over a beer over this or it's something that I've seen on Twitter a couple of times down the years but Saipan happened when you were in university correct yeah in my, in my, in my second year second year um I, I, that's actually it's an interesting kind of um touchstone that in itself given I suppose what we're talking about uh, and given the course you guys are studying because I, like, I did journalism in DIT and I remember even at the time and it's something you still see now there, there can actually be a little bit of a snideness from kind of old school hacks about, oh, you don't need a journalism degree because you can, it's all about the trade, which I actually think is bollocks. So yeah. I, actually, I probably shouldn't use that language on this. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but like having done the course, like uh, the, the one thing I, I mean, first of all, I think the course, and I assume you're, it, it does, it, it kind of tunes you into journalism and helps you, I suppose, kind of, or, or, or starts the path of thinking like a journalist. But I think one of the keys, and what's like Pan illustrated to me as well, because remember we we were doing a course on media analysis at the time, and it, and I I think it's a, it's a necessary viewpoint for journalists that helps them round the book. It gives them an analytical view of the industry as well. I think and so. Like w w I remember when I was doing Sai Pan, it was kind of all. Well, I mean, obviously I was a, I was a huge football fan, so I was obsessed with the story itself, and I was so obsessed with the media. I think I mean. I'm not sure how, how old you guys are, how much you remember, but I assume, Joe, Joe, you were certainly the same. When For like that week, it was just all about consuming media and, <laughs> and also the how, how stuff is framed, the various arguments. And like it probably proved a little bit of a... It was quite odd in the sense it, it, it probably gave me such a clear insight into uh, or uh, into some of the stuff we were talking about uh, in, in the journalism course about kind of, um, you know... In how narratives are framed, all, all the different way, the kind of the macro way media is put together, which I do think if, you, this is one thing I've noticed from actually working in the field, sometimes when you're so involved in a story, all, all you get in, and, and this is something I have noticed maybe in some of the kind of older journalists or, or journalists who would be a bit kind of derisory towards uh, university courses in that way, is that you get too involved in the story itself and don't take a step back and look at what it all means, all the different elements of how it's put together, and even kind of, and I do think to take an academic view of it as well, uh, and, and put it into a wider perspective. So, so I, I do think the course was like our studying was really good from that perspective, and I, and um, I ended up doing so. That was in second year when Saipan happened. So it was May two thousand two. Mm. I graduated then in June or May two thousand and four. That was our final year, and I did my thesis on the coverage of Saipan. Yeah. Um, so that like, and now I have to say one thing, the thesis is quite handy in that it, uh, I interviewed obviously a lot of journalists and I, it was a bit targeted at the time. So I thought, hmm, this could help with contacts. It's, <laughs> so, a great idea, no, it's a great idea. It's a great way. Cause look, journalism is like any industry, but particularly so Irish journalism and Irish sports journalism, the guys were just talking about a job that had just been posted by the examiner, for instance. Yeah. Um, it's so parochial. 
you know. So yeah. I assume that gave you a brilliant aim to the full kind of uh, community. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly yeah. I mean, not, not not that I'd say it to the likes of Emmett now. But now that you mentioned that that job, I think that that job is also to replace Emmett as well, is it? I think. Yeah. The oh right. Uh, apparently, uh, uh, like I know the Examiner have been posting on their own job, but apparently it's the Irish Times job, from what I've heard. Well, Tony's going to be joining in a couple of in a while at some stage. Okay. Right. He's also. Yeah. Um, maybe he'll give the lads a bit of insight. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's 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 a hell of a way to actually. Like if for you, it was a hell of a way to kind of get in and meet people, yeah. and people and network with people. But that was yeah, and then like so, I mean that like because I kind of knew Paul Howard because he lived the guy that writes Russell Carl Kelly. Who people almost don't associate him, but for a long time he's one of the best sports writers in the country. Uh, so because he lived near me, and uh, Paul gave me a little bit of an in to the Tribune, so that when uh, I mean this this is one thing I would say that what I found actually I slightly regret I didn't do more of. And it's probably valuable for maybe you guys where I was thinking I should have done more, tried to do more paid journalism work while I was studying, which would involve, I suppose, covering matches, trying to get sub editor shifts. And I suppose that's it's a little bit of a different environment in that regard now. Uh, but that was kind of we because I remember in fourth year, just after I finished my thesis, actually, we had a day trip to the uh, to the Tribune office. Right. And it was me. It was me and another bloke, Owen Murphy, actually, who ended up being a showbiz journalist for years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, who went up to the Tribune sports desk and uh, the, the sports editor kind of recognised my name from, I think maybe Paul, and because I'd entered the Peter Ball and finished second or third two right. years in a row. Yeah, and literally the week we f- finished my degree looking up, I was actually, I was going to be going off, um, I think London basically, but on a kind of, you know, a piss up two months essentially. Yeah. Uh, but he basically said, we've got, we've got two or three shifts a week, do you want to come in? And I said, yeah, that, like, Wait, I basically kind of put all my summer plans on hold and decided it and kind of uh, and, and went from there. And then I did a master's then while in that first year, which is kind of so I kind of complemented studying and uh, and trying to get into the job full time. Yeah, yeah, but it's I do think it's something to think about while you're studying, trying to try and even because you're studying like not that you don't want to earn money, but the pressure to earn money isn't as high. So it's probably it, it's worth that to try and get experience in places because I mean, I know. I know there's always a bit of tension between, say, uh, like, what, you know, how, at what point should should a experience become like actual paid work, and mm-hmm. that is a doubt. That's something that people should always be conscious of. They should be taken advantage of. But the work experience I found is very valuable in the sense that, first of all, if you go into an office or work with, work with a desk for a few weeks and you do, you prove yourself reliable, desks will come back to you. They'll kind of they'll say, okay, we, we've got we've got a little bit of an opening here. Uh, we, we we can give this uh, this guy or girl a, a go. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's something I had kind of like three or four questions down, but uh, I might kind of start with it because uh, a bit like myself, earlier in your career, you did have that kind of copy editing experience. And as we kind of focus in on today's class and field reporting and match reporting, being on the receiving end of match reports, whether it was by email or through the CMS or whatever, is can be can be a hell of a way to kind of learn about what goes into a match report and what makes a good or a bad match report, yeah. a good or bad field report, be it you know. Um, the learning experience of that, did you find that kind of particularly helpful? Oh yeah, totally. I mean, I think subbing in general, it just it just teaches you. You just almost by the more you go, and especially when you have to cut something by say two hundred words, you kind of just develop that instinct for. What words are wasted? What aren't? What what can be sharpened? But then, of course, that's all heightened when it's uh, when it's a live report, and especially if you're kind of under pressure. I mean, like when say, I mean, you say you say when, when the turnaround really is that tight, when you get when the reporter sends something in on the final whistle, and you have to have it subbed and ready within five minutes. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you can, as, as Joe says, you just you you, you develop that instinct insight for what works and all. it's interesting also on the um on the sub editing side in general but i remember when i kind of made the transition kind of from subbing to more writing more to, until until i was eventually just wholly writing i felt i was really sharp on stuff like that and kind of little grammatic grammatical things and now because i haven't subbed properly in years it's amazing how much i've actually forgotten in terms of kind of the little, the little things like that yeah. which uh <laughs> but, you know i, I I get conscious of it sometimes. Yeah, there's, and there's so many small rules, and I'm sure it's something that at different times in your career when you freelance, uh, you, 
those kind of small rules, whether it be style guides or bloody teams and scores, details or things like that. But when you're actually on the desk and you're the guy that is guy or girl that is, um, you know, tightening up those details, like you say, five minutes to a print deadline, you realize that, you know, having the first name of a player at first reference is actually fucking important. It's yeah, a- yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, also, you learn writers' little ticks and stuff that can be thrown out straight away. Like, he always yeah. uses that phrase, gone. <laughs> yeah, you also can learn every local GAA correspondent in Ireland. I thought it was a great way to get to know the country. Um, yeah, yeah. But yeah, if we go back to the start, can you think of, I actually couldn't think of my own here when I, when I was writing down this question. Can you remember the first time you filed on deadline? Uh, like, um, major outlet or, for, you know? For a major outlet, because I was doing stuff for the college, but that actually that wasn't deadline, though, I suppose, because it, was, it, was, yeah. it was a monthly thing. Uh, I think the first I did was actually for, it was schools rugby, because that was, I, I mean, I, I never I never grew up uh, watching or knowing rugby. And I, I remember the, fir- the first time before I did a schools rugby game, because it was suggested to me by, like, Paul and people like that, it's a good way to immediately get live match experience. Yeah. Um, because I probably wouldn't have been developed enough yet to do even League of Ireland at that point. Yeah. Uh, and I'm having to, literally looking up the rules of rugby and the positions the night before, uh, <laughs> the night before I did the game. That, that was the first one. I, I remember, I think I did it for the, uh, I did something like Michaels against Belvedere for the, uh, I think it was for the Irish Times and the Indo. And yeah. having to change, I was the head, the, 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 I mean, it was essentially the same report, but having to change the, um, the intro. But I, I, I think I had, it, it wasn't quite, live live writing because i had a few hours because it was it was early in the day but like you know, it was one of the classic you're poor it's only 200 words and you're pouring over it and making sure everything is spot on <laughs> and then they change anyway yeah. <laughs> but i think the first, the first one i did live like properly live where it was real pressure um it was i think an ireland wales game um in the in the in the staunton campaign for the sunday tribune uh, at croke park even ireland scored and it was it was comments. It, was, it wasn't a live report. Yeah. Uh, and I do I do and that was one. I, I, that's actually one. I mean, it's one of the things I found. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you'll be able to relate to this as well, Joe. How you, you evolve in that sense. Whereas, pro- I remember being so conscious before the game, but I had loads of kind of different intros and ready to go for different situations. And I kind of used them. But it's amazing now. Like once you get used to it, and all, and even early on though, you you kind of realize no matter how much you prepare, and it is always good to prepare, and you will still always use like even like now like like Johnny Lou say who's one of one of the best in the business of live writing, the amount of pre prepared lines he still uses because like that that's one of the tricks of the trade. But all, but when you try and kind of get a full intro that frames everything, you just realize how much becomes completely redundant, and he, and you do just learn an instinct for writing as it goes. Yeah, is it something that you enjoy? Because there are some, it, it's interesting when you speak about generational kind of divides in journalism. Like, look, some journalists absolutely love it and it's all they do. And some actually really don't like filing on deadline. Yeah. Aren't very good at it. There's lots of very good journalists that aren't very good filing on deadline. I, I have to say I love it. Um, I, and I, spe- I mean, okay, right, when, when you go to it, and I suppose this is, this is how my, like, my, my 17-year-old se- self would hate me saying this. <laughs> when you go to a kind of a, a random Saturday Premier League game is oh, like where, you, where it doesn't really matter that much. You're kind of like, I can't be, I can't be bothered with this. Right. But like I, when it's a big game, I absolutely love it. Like it's, it's like, and I suppose some of the examples I've sent to Joe maybe illustrate this, I suppose, because it's almost like the, the one thing I should say, actually, there's always this weird thing where you feel it's obviously an honor to be like to be witnessing great sporting events that will go down in history and all the rest of it. But there's always that push pull because you're not actually fully taking them in because you're trying to write. But that, in, in a strange way, it almost makes you, well, in your own mind, uh, part of the occasion because the tension on the pitch, like you feel this kind of pressure, I find, to really reflect and say something. Like it's not just, it's not just reporting anymore. I think this, this is particularly true now in comparison, say, 10 or even 20 years ago. You actually have to say something. Like just reporting isn't good enough. So you're trying to capture something about this, this huge event that will... Hopefully, say in a few years' time, you look back, will actually stand to you well and stand to the event well. And I, I have to say, I really, I really enjoy that pressure. And it, I, I, it, it does add. It's one of the areas of the job where there's a real adrenaline to it. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 yeah. Yeah. It, it's interesting. Like I, you know, I asked Miguel for a suggestion of a deadline piece that he was uh, proud of or worth kind of chatting about. And your initial suggestion was the 2019 FA Cup final, but then kind of literally 90 seconds later. 
you jump to Barcelona 6, PSG 1. It's kind of remarkable in lots of ways that we think of any other game of football besides that game of football because it was yes. just so bloody. Uh, and let me bring it up here, actually. I'm just going to screen share uh, while we're here. Um, it was... And it it was great to actually even just go back and uh, have a have a fresh kind of read of it, um, and fresh a fresh look at the even just the kind of five minute highlights. But I guess your memories of that night and that report I'm interested in. Like first off, you know, um, going there. Like, was there even a kind of a sense in yourself that this could happen? Weirdly, yeah. So, I, funny enough, I was kind of going through this myself because I did, I did a kind of a big read on this a few weeks ago. Then it's, right. ama- it's amazing how that jogs the memory. But yeah, I do because Barca had some big results in the week before, and just from from the Monday. I remember we went the day before, so at the press conference, mm. and it was just that sense growing that hang on, so there's something could happen here, and all the kind of talk, all of us around it talking ourselves into the idea that they got. If they got one goal, then it becomes a bit more kind of logically possible. Then they get a second. Then suddenly it's not overcoming a four nil anymore. It's just getting two more goals. So you, there, there was something around the stadium and even among us in the press that that could grow. But just just w- one thing that I always kind of remember, and I suppose maybe this is uh, instructive as regards actually doing these. Because obviously, I think that 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 ends up being eight hundred or nine hundred. And yeah. w- one of the things about that night as well, it's not so relevant now, but we used to have. Uh, uh, a contractual deal with the I. Um, they they're no longer part of it, but it meant that we had to file live for them as well as us. So now, if it's just us at the indie, we they all they want is kind of eight hundred words on the whistle ever. But for the I at the time, they had they had this old school editor. I thought you might have worked with a Matt Tench. Right. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, he insisted on the old school. I, I've never understood why they do this, but I suppose it's 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 related to what I'm going to talk about, it, it, where you basically you, you you have to file in takes. So like at halftime, if it's 800 words at halftime, you'll file three to 400 words. On 70 minutes, you'll file another another chunk. And then and then at the end, you file a top and a tail. And I suppose it's just in case when it's that pressure, if anything goes wrong, they just have copy they can use, no matter what that copy is. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but I, 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 I did find it annoying. I, I do generally find it annoying because it means that like a first half take, which is going to be half the piece. It might like say the United game yesterday. Well, yeah. if you while you're older, half time will be almost irrelevant by the end. Of course. Um, of course. But for, for that, for that, for this night, it actually weirdly worked. Right. Uh, just, but I remember thinking, and, and this is something I still do, because obviously, when 800 words, no matter how good you are, you can't get that out in five minutes before the end. So yeah, you, you, you have to, you have to write as you go. So a, a particular challenge in a night like this, when it's so open and so much can change, and it's so, so like say, I think it was two nil at half time, so it was very much up for grabs. I remember having to trying to write in a way, which is why it was like, I remember this, or why I particularly enjoyed this night, not just because of what happened on the pitch, although obviously that was incredible, but because it was so testing from a concentration perspective that I remember having to, trying to write every sentence. So it was so open-ended that I could work whether Barca went through or they, whether they went out. Or, or some, something, I think there's a line, um, if I can find it, but it was some sort of line I had around three quarters of the way down that was almost like, and this is another little trick of the trade, I suppose. A sentence that you can use as a kind of a launch. That they can yes. go. So if it goes either way, you know, yes. like oh, sometimes that's as simple as a question. Like, oh, the question then was whether they could capitalize on this or whether it would you. So, so you can tease out some little theme. Um, so I, I think one of the things I used that night was something about the psychology of it. Right. Um, and yeah, yeah. So there's one of the lines there, and so then it, so like there's a line there about how Bar- how PSG couldn't string three passes together. So of course, so say if that drastically changed the last five minutes, you can go with that and exactly. go how they completely collapsed, or else kind of just pivot and say something like they um oh, was, they, they they managed to rally or whatever. Yeah, it was your jumping off point for kind of the next line as it builds. As it yeah, builds. yeah, exactly. And, as, and sometimes it, 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 it's the trick. And I have been in situations like on live games where. You've kind of written. You think you're being clever, and you write yourself into a corner, and you're like, "Oh Christ, yeah. how can I get out of this?" Um. <laughs> yeah, no, I have, I've I've got a corner that I was going to show them later on in the second hour of the lecture that I got myself into. Um, but I, I am particularly interested in, uh, and it's something that you do very well uh, on a few different occasions. But if we look at it here, I went back and looked at it. Uh, first off, actually, let's just click on this tweet because I think this really rams it home for the guys. Oh shit! I don't want to click on that. 
but that's four fifty. Sorry, that that's uh, that's Toronto time. So nine fifty five p.m. The game would have finished, I think, around nine forty, nine forty five, something like that, because it was six minutes of added time, right? So it, we're talking less than ten minutes between you hitting send, the guys in the office having, I'm sure, the quickest quickest look, putting a headline on it, and you tweeting it out, and I think. A, that kind of really rams home how insanely good a job you did on this, given that three goals three goals were in the last six minutes. But B, something that you have done consistently is this, which I love. Um, and I, I, I'll, I'll forward these tweets onto the guys. But in, in one sense, it's almost like a journalism version of here's how the sausage is made. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, um, but how have you found the reaction when you do this kind of thing? Like, are people oh. surprised? Is it something so, that... So, yeah. So, so uh, there is always a little bit where some people are kind of, oh, this, this is cheating a bit. But it's not. The, like, it's, just, it's just how it has to be done. And also, I don't think because... what ha- And even I'm, I'm thinking in terms of kind of intros, like as I was saying there, no, no matter what pre-prepared intro you have, over the course of the game, that will change or it might fit. And what, what, I felt, like, what I found like... I mean, this is going to sound very kind of wanky and pretentious, but I remember reading um, an interview with... Uh, Joe Esterhouse, I think it was, the, the screenwriter. And he was talking about, like, even with a film, sometimes you don't actually know. You might have an idea of the ending, but sometimes in the course of writing it or in the course of helping fans out, the, like, the ending will just appear to you like kind of a, I think the line he used was like <laughs> a ship out of the fog. And it can sometimes be like that when you're live writing, where suddenly it's 70 minutes in and something just strikes you. Like, so what, what I do in those cases, I go, I'll kind of I'll write little lines that occur to me in the, uh, in the situation. Yeah, and then, and then kind of building them as they go. Or kind of so in that game, I think one of the one of the weird things about that game, given how mad it was, was that there was actually a significant lull for about twenty minutes. And I did use that twenty minutes basically. I I did, I did that PSG because I think this was just after Cavani's goal. And I said right, and it was because like, the thing was right. This is done. But like it was one of those things like given right, given how the night's gone, I'll just get this done to have it ready and do it now because yeah, you never know what's going to happen. So I, I did it then. And then, of course, literally, I think literally that night, and again, this is, this happened so often, but literally the minute I'd finished, kind of had that as I wanted it, um, then Neymar got the free kick, and then it was kind of, oh, Christ, this, this is suddenly on it. Here we go again. Um, and it's interesting, actually, just, I mean, again, Joe, I'm sure you'll relate to this a lot. <laughs> Sometimes when you're doing a live game like that, you don't support, like people always go on about bias and journalism and all that. You don't, you don't, you don't support the outcome. You support <laughs> what suits what you've written. Like the amount of times you're witnessing something incredible and you go, oh, I quite like that intro I had. <laughs> that, 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 that's got to go now. <laughs> well, actually, it's funny you say it because when I was, I was trying to dig out this tweet because I knew in my mind that you had done this. And then I searched Miguel Delaney and intro. And there's actually a couple of other buttes that you've kind of put out there. And it's very interesting. Let me go back. Uh, here we go. Um, the intro that wasn't. You've done a few of them, and it's it's, it's yeah, yeah. It's, 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 almost, it's almost like oh, I put effort into this, and now the world's never going to see it. <laughs> yeah. And it, but do, okay. Do, do, actually, do, the one thing I do slightly regret about this one is right. the phrase. Um, but I suppose you have to have it ready. The phrase their players celebrated with unbridled joy because that hadn't happened yet. So I was kind of I was. I mean, it's a fair assumption to make that Atlanta are going to are going to celebrate right. um, celebrate beating Paris Saint Germain. Okay. But, uh, but it, well, technically, that that was that was one that was a little bit mischievous, I say, because that that's not really reporting. That that was me imagining a situation as opposed okay. to just trying to come up with a line. And this one was uh, England, England, Slovenia, um, and nil nil is obviously a bloody nightmarish one where an awful lot of intros get thrown away. Where you know a game is at nil nil with when when did Kane score pretty late in this game? Is it? Yeah, yeah. I mean it, show, it shows how interchangeable those World Cup qualifiers, qualifiers are. I literally don't even remember this game. <laughs> that's what I was going to say. Yeah, um, there's a couple others there. What's this one? Uh, May 28, 2016. Uh, oh, that was the Champions League final. I think that's the first time I did it. Yeah, actually, this is a, this is a whole other kind of one. You've actually shown two alternate inf- intros, and I guess one of these came to pass. Because yeah, yeah. He's further down, sorry. Because the only thing about that, the thing about that was that was penalties. So penalty, I mean, because you can't really re- report live on penalties yeah. unless like one of the one of the misses is particularly spectacular. So and all, also it's quite weird with penalties because it just give, it gives you the kind of time to uh, to just ready yourself because yeah, it's 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 quite it's quite a weird situation reporting live on a penalty shootout actually. Yeah, yeah, I've done a few. 
because you actually end up kind of not really focusing on like you pick one or two players right you might pick yeah a, yeah you know because because also like if you're giving giving a blow by blow penalty shootout was actually quite boring yeah because it's, it's, it's the watching of the drama no one wants to read then he scored then he went high then um it's more about kind of the little the little things that come out and obviously the human drama and that kind of so for a shootout that gives you time to basically because and the good thing about a shootout in that sense and it's why actually the, it's slightly easier to say report in a situation where it's it's so the, the Barca one had so many different permutations but ultimately it was still quite binary either PSG or Barca were going through and that's the same say with like a Champions League final or a World Cup or a Euro, Euro European Championships game where for a knockout it's it's, it's going to be one or the other um, yeah I, it's, it, I wonder what the kind of you touched on it there and I actually had it earlier I don't know why I skipped over it but in the past kind of definitely kind of last decade but you know you could say even a little bit longer than that it's you know the the skill and also the, I guess the challenge of um, deadline match reporting has changed remarkably with kind of social media and the kind of level of instant analysis and kind of condensing condensing of moments. Like so, when you are going to do a game now, do you very much feel that there has to be analysis? There has to be kind of yeah. something more than than just the blow by blow. Oh uh, uh, yeah, that uh, that's increasingly I think because ultimately. And it's a discussion we've had in time. Like, not, I mean, if you just report on what happened, unless, say, you're a Barney or a Johnny Lou or someone who kind of the joy of their writing is almost their descriptiveness and like because they're that good. And it's, it's a different form of sports reporting. But if ultimately reporting just kind of just isn't doesn't record anymore. And I, and, I, and I think this is actually one of the ways where social media is a positive in terms of how it hones journalism. But it's show, like it's. Say we you know, sometimes sometimes we often think about this as well, and this actually does help in terms of sometimes honing your thinking for a live report. If I'm putting this up on Twitter, what how would I sum it up? What would I say to people? What like and, and that's almost a good way of thinking about these games as well. Where it's ultimately what like what does this game say about the teams or the situation? And I think that that's what the journalist now has to do as well, because just reporting one team won or lost or whatever kind of just it doesn't appeal to readers anymore they want to and also in most cases they've seen what happened they've experienced it live yeah like that so the journal the, the written journalist job has evolved in that way and you, i think it's about what it, it's about stating something or, or yeah. bringing the discussion on yeah and that's the thing like we've chatted with the guys obviously there are exceptions to that rule in terms of kind of local gaa college yeah. GAA, where people haven't seen the game but by and large now it is very much kind of um expected and accepted by kind of us the, the guys who are the, the people who are in the press box that there has to be a kind of a bit more of a depth to it and um, i really appreciate your time man i realized that we're 45 minutes into it right, right, right. I, I did kind of talk about kind of the past year the past 14 months and filing remotely because again if we think back to kind of when we were cutting our teeth filing off the tv was a very dirty term oh you know? yeah like a very much the old school journalists were like never file off the tv it's almost like yeah. never work for free you know because well even that's that's the, i know like so some of the pack over here in england uh that some of them still refuse to which right. i think i mean is kind of like preposterous in the situation where we literally can't go to some champions league away games and it's teams you cover like say like the chelsea pack couldn't couldn't go to seville last week so in that situation, you're going to have to, and it's ludicrous the paper doesn't cover it. But yeah, you're right. It, it was always seen as a bit of a, a no-no. Which, you know, <laughs> I'd come from the Sunday Tribune where there was very little money. <laughs> so like often for some away games, um, we'd, like, they'd, they'd send one, it would have been Mal or, or, or someone like that. And I'd be doing something, I could, I, could do, I could be doing something from the office or whatever. So I was kind of a little bit more used to, and a little bit more used to maybe the fluidity now. But now we're in a situation where, uh, it has to be done, because only, and also not just that. So if it's a big game, say it, this is starting to evolve this week, funnily enough. And I think United now allow two into games, and so do England. But like for for most of the last year and a bit, it's only been one journalist per publication allowed into matches. And obviously, like if it's a big game, you know, papers and media and, and readers they want to work on it. They want to read various writers. Yeah. Um, so in that case, people have to do it off TV. But. Uh, it's it's a weird it's a weird one. Even like oh, I did Bayern PSG last week off TV, and like I've, oh. this is this is such a kind of a first world complaint. Sorry, this is a, this is a very entitled complaint. But I did think to myself last week, if it was normal times, I would have been in Madrid on the Tuesday and Munich on the Wednesday. Yeah. But, but even doing that game, and like this is this was an amazing game. 
up. It was along with Juve Porto, one of the best games I've seen in a long time. But it was quite even doing it live, and this was quite testing, obviously, because a there was no, it was a first leg, so there was no binary outcome. It was going to be it was quite open ended, uh, and also Bayern were absolutely really hammering PSG for the last minute, so like it was very much up in the air. But I found it, even though I was very involved in the game, I found reporting live on it a much more kind of passive and less involved experience than if I was um, if it was in the stadium. And there's a whole interesting other debate there. I mean, whatever about kind of the old uh, the old journalistic view, uh, the, amount, the amount of times I've had people asking me, like, or even like when I've been with friends or I'm going to the match line, like, oh, could, could you not just do it off, to, off home and stay here or something like that? <laughs> but... <laughs> But, but it, it's hard to explain, but I mean, for, first of all, a fundamental journalism is still ultimately going somewhere and reporting yeah. and, you know, saying what you're seeing. And that, 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 that remains like, crucially important no matter what. But even when you're there, you will still pick up things. And it's almost like, like I'm sure you, you know this, Joe, as well. Like, it's almost like your, your writing is informed almost by osmosis. Like you yep. can't, it's not like you can pick out things exactly that, oh, I've seen that and that, that was me valuable. It's just like, it's about, because you're ultimately there to capture the an occasion as well. And obviously this is more relevant when there's crowds, but I think that that's why it's important to be there. And um, and you yeah. do just pick up so yeah. much more. But it, it, do, it does feel a, it does feel like genuinely colder experience when, you, when you're sat at home and a bit more of a mechanical experience. Yeah, and you know, there's so much around it. Like, like you say, there's yeah. so much kind of being there, but then also being there afterwards in the couple of hours after the yeah. game. You know, when you think of like, you know, you're at a stage now where you're expected to have not just an opinion, but a level of analysis on all of the top footballers in the world. But there is so much that you learn from a mix zone. From yeah, the, yeah, completely. For small little nuggets, but of how people might treat the press, how people might be, how Ronaldo might be interacting with his teammates. Um, yeah. Etra, like there's so many little things that you can pick up from being there. Um, yeah, and I, I even how, how people say things. Yeah, 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 100%. But then yeah. if we kind of think like, so the assignment for the guys this week will be to kind of file a live piece from one of the Champions League games. Like, are there any tips you have from filing from the TV? Obviously this is, like I thought this was a great piece because there's it, almost something meta about this piece because you're speaking about how coronavirus and empty stadiums have kind of uh, maybe not have been the cause of because, you know, you make a great point that since 2018, 19, the home away kind of um, that kind of divide has kind of lessened a lot. But also what you're bringing into it is how COVID and empty stadiums have really kind of rammed that home. And, you know, you're not there because of COVID too. So I just thought there was kind of yeah. a, a slight kind of meta sense to it, but, like, do you kind of have to sound out some of the commentary because you're watching a game, but you're also kind of listening to fucking Jim Beglin or Andy Townsend's <laughs> take while you're trying to come up with your own take? I have to say, sometimes that can help. I mean, I, one of the weird things about actually be, um, being in stadiums for for uh, in the current situation is that because I can't use the normal press boxes because they have to spread us out, where a lot of us, sometimes you're all over the stadium, and sometimes you actually don't have a TV, which is, I oh. mean, for live writing is... As you know, it's it, it makes some difference. Yeah, it's a nightmare. Yeah, um, and I, I so uh, sometimes commentary can be helpful in that regard. Now, I, I do know some journal. I, I think I think this is cheating. A, I, don't, I wouldn't say cheating, but I I wouldn't like. I know some journalists who will say they'll be at a game and they'll have an earpiece in their ear and they'll be listening to Five Live. And while I think that's valuable in terms of knowing having all the details you need, the problem there I think is that can slightly maybe dilute your own view uh because sometimes it's better it's better to come to your own but and ultimately ultimately right and like th th this applies to even when i found when someone when an editor gives you an idea or where you have your own idea it's for something it always feels pure and easier to do and it's better when it's your own thought or your own like you, you know you know when when someone tony used to always do this a lot ask you to write a piece that you don't necessarily agree with and it's always a bit more con contorted or uh <laughs> I used to do it a lot to my own writers too. I think it's just a yeah. general thing, sports, right? Sports, because sports editors are so bitter that they're not writing. They just kind of desperately <laughs> want to see some yeah, of yeah. it's kind of presented. But yeah. Um, yeah, but so that that's exactly. Uh, um, but actually, on the, on the coronavirus thing as well, one of the things um, I, 
I, I this is always something you wonder the more time goes on, whether it becomes passe, but there's, there always feels this kind of inclination when you watch a great game like that in front of, and especially if you're in the stadium um, and it's in front of no fans, it's, it's almost like, do you feel, do I have to add the usual now, which is the only pity was that there weren't fans here to see it, or it was a game worth kind of 80,000 people. And at what, at what point do we stop doing that, if you know what I mean? And I've, I've noticed myself doing that less anyway. I don't think I reference it in this piece. Um, but yeah, that's always... But, but in general, I suppose, when it comes to kind of live writing that way, it's almost like you, it's a little trick you have to play with yourself. And it's almost, it, I think, trying to, trying to project it forward. We're thinking, if I... And I, I find this how this is... And I found this even when I'm, when I'm doing a tweet to sell, not even a match report, but a feature or a news line or whatever... Because because Twitter, you're ultimately trying to get people's eyes on people to click on it. I mean, is, whatever people say about clickbait, it's still the goal of any journalism to make people read what you want. Yeah. But so it's almost like thinking, if I was to sum this up for someone right now, what's the most interesting thing in it? And so say like say, and a classic thing is like say one of those massive long athletic features, um, where there's loads of little bits of detail. They yeah. kind of say uh, you sell it on one point. Then what actually takes off sometimes is some little bit of detail, some little bit of color. Mm-hmm. That and that people are oh that's a, that, that's interesting, and it, so it, it, it's kind of I think even when writing live it's about kind of putting yourself in that sort of mind frame when you are summing this up what will you what will you tell someone what will what what did this game say about the two teams what's interesting about it what does it reveal about them and once you once you can hone that down then you can kind of build your intro um, and like, and the one thing I mean this this is a it, I suppose this is difficult starting out but always avoid, unless you're working for an agency avoid the agency intro of last night Manchester United won 2 nil to do whatever because it's just so do- but the one thing I would say and it, sometimes when I've been really stuck for an intro a little trick I've used is basically imagining the blandest dullest way I could put it first sentence and then kind of and then because re- then, then you kind of think to yourself okay there's something and then it, what I can do better than that and then from there, you can kind of you kind of actually develop. Uh, it's 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 weird how it works, but it, but it just it just means basically you've got something on the page, you can tinker with it a little bit. Um, yeah, and, and it means you're never going to go blank. Yeah, in terms of some other kind of tricks and things like that, how how much would you generally have done? Uh, like, at what point of the game are you hoping that you have kind of your full match report done that you can kind of then start filtering through it? Like, is it kind of the 80, 85 minute mark where yeah. you almost want it in your web, in your email browser rather than kind of in your Word document? Yeah, yeah. that's exactly it. You want, to, uh, you, you, want, you want it in your email browser or in, your, in, your, in the email draft for two minutes before the end, really, so you can go, you can go over it like that. And I have to say, like, even on a night like that 6-1, which there is, there's, a, there's such a kind of a, an ego, egotistical pride about pressing send the second that the, yeah. the ref yeah. blows the whistle, and you, you've not just sent it on time, but you've actually had, had a chance to kind of just just give it a quick one over. Yeah, um, they, they, they have to say that, that that does appeal in the job in that sense. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, yeah. Ideally, you'd give you'd, you'd be having ten minutes, you get to go over it, but of course that's a uh, that's 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 not always possible. And like there's sometimes of sometimes you're sent you're just getting it out and you're you know, you know that it kind of works in terms of how it or it broadly works in terms of how it's written, but you're kind of praying there's no errors in there or or big um and I actually from from, from a southern perspective, Joe, this is something I've always considered myself. Do <laughs> do we did we did you prefer stuff that says something that's that's sloppy or stuff that doesn't really say much but is ultra clean? Uh, probably the former still, isn't it? it? It should be the former. It should be the former. Unfortunately, I've come across enough people who kind of just prefer the latter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, and usually they're kind of like the chief sub kind of guys or a, a deputy sports editor who values getting out the door at 10.01. Um, yeah. But yeah, th- there is kind of that aspect to it. I, look, me, every day of the week, I'd much prefer kind of something that has a, a, a tiny kind of bit of sloppiness to it, but actually you're not scrabbling around for a headline as a copy. Yeah, yeah. The headline jumps straight out at you because Miguel has filed a report where I know exactly what the headline's going to be yeah. on this because he's nailed it in just, three parts. Just on that as well, and something that struck as you said that, and another little trick I find I use is, because obviously, yeah, you, you want to avoid just reporting run of play, but B, you have to get in details. 
but see, you, you, you need to be kind of writing as you go. So what I try to do is, if there's been a goal or a major incident or something, write on that, but use that as a kind of make a point or something within the description of that. So again, it's not just dry description. It's also, it's it's saying something about the game and something you can potentially build on as well. I mean, obviously it helps when it's one of the, the major players or like M- Mappe that, that does it. Yeah. But, um, Sure. But yeah, but, but but I think that that's huge, and that, that's good kind of basically placeholding copy, but stuff that you can, that can still use later on. Yeah, and then you can kind of if it's a if it's a hundred and fifty word paragraph that you end up kind of having to trim back to kind of thirty, but it can still be that jumping off point, which is clearly what a couple of the the, the lines in the Barcelona piece were. Yeah, we can, uh, just on that, I mean, in that in that sense, it's why kind of WhatsApp groups or kind of work chats so helpful. I, like I I wasn't working yesterday, but. I was off, but I was still kind of, I was on our work WhatsApp and it's amazing how just, so like we had one reporter on live and one reporter on doing the kind of sidebar color, which is some sort of comment in the game and just how it evolves in that sense. And it's, it's, it's something to kind of try and track, I suppose, if, if you're writing live. So like at half time yesterday in the United game, the, obvi- the main talking point was VAR. Now mm-hmm. there's obviously there's bigger arguments about whether people actually still want to read about that, but it had been the biggest thing in the game. Yeah, as controversial as that McTominay incident was, by 90 minutes, it felt like the VAR was just completely irrelevant. It just did not, it did not, there was so much more to say about the game. And, and that's, it, that's one of the things to be conscious of as well. So like when, you, when you've done a big piece, you've still got to try, and this is where your intro can save you as well, where you can kind of, even if the, even if the next 600 words don't necessarily say, or don't fully cover yeah. what you want to say, but you can, you can just put it in, into that sort of flow where you, you've captured the essence of what the game is about. Mm-hmm. Uh, what it becomes about what the big discussions are, and I, I think that that's 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 something that's become more important than say like so in the you know in the in the old days when well, you've got to get your facts up front all the rest of it. Now your intro has to capture what the game is about, what its main consequence is, and, and that's why, in one sense, what the fallout is likely to be, what we're yeah. likely to be talking about on Match of the Day two, and indeed in Monday morning. Yeah, a, 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 exactly, exactly, yeah. Um, and it's yeah, and it's always about that, and that's why I always try and gear my first line or two towards that. What what the main storyline is, mm. uh, and like it, it can be a particular challenge actually sometimes when it's two big teams. So no matter how big the storyline is, ultimately you've got to get like so it's not like Chelsea steamroller in Crystal Palace or whatever, where well, most of the focus is on Chelsea. Say so yeah. you, you like so say if Chelsea steamroller Liverpool, you know both sides are as big as each other. So you've got to try and kind of bring that together in in one line that hopefully is some way pithy or captures the occasion. Um, Miguel, I'm sure the guys have a couple of questions, but I just want yeah, to... Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Which was just in a wider sense when you take a step back, and I think you actually touched on one aspect of this right off the jump, but are there any things that you wish you did more of or less of earlier in your career? Like where, when the guys are thinking of the guys early in their career, are there, I, I, like you said, kind of doing more work, as much work as possible and as much opportunities? But in terms of nuts and bolts of writing, is there anything that kind of you look back on and think, oh, I wish I did a bit more of or less of? The, the one thing, I, this is probably that you don't fully appreciate. Like, it's easy to say it now, but it's something you don't fully appreciate until you start writing live yourself. Because then you start realizing, like, it, it's one of those things that kind of clicks your brain into gear. But, mm-hmm. like, it's kind of, say, seeing how writers you admire tackled, or the writers you'd want to follow, say, tackled big subject. What do they write about it? What was their live piece? What do they concentrate on? And just seeing how basically, you know, almost deconstructing what they did and seeing how they dealt with it, what what, what they focused on. May, may, uh, but but again, it's quite weird. And that that's something that you'll only learn a real appreciation for when you start doing it yourself. So actually, from that perspective, I would just um, almost badger desks and stuff like that for any sort of experience or or, or, or look, even, even working for local papers in terms of kind of stringing, just because it will um, it, it, it will help, and it, it's a really valuable experience. And and you never know where what door is going to lead where. Yeah, for sure. Uh, guys, have you got any questions for Miguel either on kind of the pieces that I send you guys to read, or indeed anything wider? Um, yeah, I might jump on there. Just um, yeah. in terms of skills that are very necessary and most important ones, I suppose, in being a sports journalist slash sports supporter. Now, you may well say be able to do everything, but um, just with your own opinion on, on what, what you really have to nail down. Um, and I suppose what's the most important skill, if you could point out one. Is it, well, it's interesting you say that, Shane, because we actually have this discussion a lot. And it's almost like a spectrum with journalists where on one side, like, what, what's, what's ultimately the job about? It's about 
telling people something interesting and that, that can either be true a form of writing or something that they don't know uh, and so there's almost a spectrum that we find that almost goes along certain personality types so in one spectrum you've got telling people something they don't know which by kind of by definition comes from being a reporter which involves having a bit of a brass neck and you know not being, being asked questions where you're People are totally absent of any sort of self-consciousness. A classic example being Paul Rowan, uh, <laughs> uh, who, who did a very good book on, on Champagne football. But then, and then the, on the other side, it's about, you know, really, you know, it's really excellent writing, which ultimately I'd say probably by generally comes from maybe more introverted personality types or more peculiar personality types, just because the nature of the job. Um, and it's about it's about where you fall in that spectrum. We we all we, I mean one thing we said people who are good at both are usually sociopaths. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Or no, no people sorry people who are excellent at both. Yeah. <laughs> but so they're, so they're self conscious, but then but then don't mind asking people anything. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it's 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 about that balance really. Uh, it's about ultimately learning the knack to finding things out. And, and I suppose like contact developing and a new it's it's still it's still a very hard skill to do. And it, it is one of those that you, you'll, you, I mean, a, a course or me talking or, or Joe talking or anyone will, will, will give you pointers to it. But it's one of those things you kind of learn on the job. And like, it's about, it's, it's like, it's, it's, like, it's like anything. It's about interpersonal relationships. Yeah. Uh, it's about like, you know, with certain contacts, you'll only text them a few times. Yeah. With some, you have to badger them. Uh, and it, it is just one of those little nuanced things. But it, it's it's about ultimately ingratiating yourself with people um and, and then uh so that is that is on the other side then it's about honing your writing i suppose and if you can bring the two together in some way uh, all the better for it perfect thanks cheers for that no problem. uh anything else guys i don't realize we're over about an hour and a bit here but um, yeah, i was a bit late on no okay um anything else guys in terms of uh Maybe the stuff that, that, that we read or anything like that? No? All good, all quiet. This is, this is the joys of a small class. Q&A <laughs> sessions don't go on forever. Um, who do you like to read, Miguel, in terms of match reports? Obviously, we'll be discussing one of the one of Johnny Lou's match reports, or match, his, his piece from, obviously, the Liverpool-Barcelona game in the second half of t today's lecture. He's one of my favourites, Barney, as well. But um, are there are there others that you like or that you kind of, um, even outside of football, are there kind of other live reporters that you get? It's, it's, it's interesting you say that, like, because even something like, I, I, it was something I was thinking about, say, at the height of Brexit talks here or some big political developments, where it's kind of fascinating to see, because there isn't, it's, it's why I do think sports journalism can I, it lends itself to so many other fields. Especially the one thing you notice is how, <laughs> How unused other departments are to writing live in that sense. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm, I'm often fascinated when there's a big day of politics. Or something, how how have they narrativized it? When when they have to do their, not just their, not just a dry report or news report. When they actually have to write an analysis or a take, how they do it and how they bring it all together. You know whether they use the same concepts of, of as us, kind of like in terms of kind of trying to sum it up with a line or whatever. Um, so that that that's something I have been conscious of a lot. In terms of kind of good or sports writers, and also this this suppose is a classic kind of writer ego thing. But the morning after a big game, like that, especially when you're happy with what you've written, it's always interesting to see what what other people, yeah. other papers have done, just to just to see what they did with it. Um, like I think Danny Taylor, he doesn't do it so much anymore because his role has changed. The Athletic, he right. he used to be brilliant at that, particularly when he at the Guardian around 2013 to 2015, he used to be exceptional at that sort of live writing. Yeah. Um. I'm just trying to. I'm just trying to think. Like, yeah, it's a good point for for this week. Sorry to interrupt. You. It's a good point for this week's assignment. Is that when the guys do file their match reports, whether we end up doing the Dortmund City game or whatever, is actually to have a look around at what what kind of the, the likes of yourself have done. Yeah, yeah, and even I suppose what would be interesting in that perspective is um, like you could almost do a graph of what different people focused on and what what was the most common thread picked out. So imagine, uh, like, uh, if if City go out, which isn't suddenly not that impossible. The big one is obviously whether Pep fails again. Yeah, um, particularly in the context of the Champions League. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, super, Miguel. I've really enjoyed it, and um, it's been good to chat. Hopefully, we have a beer and it's before. Yeah, yeah. 
just the next most likely place that we'll have a beer together. Um, <laughs> I'm sure the guys have had uh, had a, a hell of a lot of insight today. Um, I would encourage them, oh, yeah. if they don't already, to follow you on Twitter um, and to kind of follow your coverage of whichever game we end up doing this week. But tomorrow yeah. I think it's Bayern PSG. And then actually on Wednesday, I've got an interesting one where, and actually this is something that being on TV allows, because there's nothing worse than, and this happened to me actually two years ago. It was the night of um, Spurs City, which was an incredible game. Oh, but yeah. I, 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 didn't, I didn't really watch it because I'd been in Barcelona for the United game the other And because I was in Barcelona, the desk just thought, oh, it's probably easier for you. You can just go to Porto and do Liverpool Porto which is a non-event. And I remember, like, there's nothing worse than doing live in a game that no one's interested, like, isn't the story anymore. Yeah. And so that, that's that, that's one thing, actually, that we, we've been talking about for Wednesday, where I think we've got Melissa, she'll do the live right, she'll do the live report on Liverpool, whereas I'm to do some, I'll be doing some commentary, but, like, our sports editor, Ben, has basically said, just be, if City become the story, be ready to switch. And that's something that, actually, TV writing allows, in a way that, you know, if we were asking because it could well be a kind of a halfway through the second half piece uh, yeah. kind of moment where City becomes the game or indeed Liverpool becomes the game. Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah, yeah. Super interesting. OK, so that's on the reading list for next week, guys. Um, Miguel, thanks very much, guys. Yeah, you guys, can, pleasure. Well, man, I really appreciate it. Um, no and guys, I'm going to take a break and we'll come back in about 10 minutes. OK, see you guys. Best of luck. Thank you. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Thank you.